This is chapter 8, Physical Development in the Preschool Years. We're talking about 3, 4, 5, and 6-year-olds. The average 6-year-old weighs about 46 pounds and is 46 inches tall. Kind of funny, a pound an inch. Uh, but there is a huge difference in with individuals in height and weight. Boys tend to be taller and heavier than girls. There's a lot of cultural and racial differences as well. 10% of 6-year-olds weigh 55 pounds or more. 10% weigh 36 pounds or less. Some of the differences uh, are related, as I said, to gender and race. Um, and a lot of it has also to do with socioeconomic factors. We notice when we look at a preschooler and we compare them to someone, an infant, so kind of thinking about a one-year-old compared to a four or five-year-old, they're less chubby, they're rounder, they slender out a little bit. Um, their arms and legs get a little longer. And by age six, their proportions become very similar to the proportions they'll have in their adult body. They are becoming stronger, muscle size increases, and bones are becoming sturdier. Uh, the sense organs are all becoming uh, much more developed as well. So this just shows the difference in weight with boys and with girls, um, in weight as well as in height. There's an increase in myelination during the preschool years. And by the end of preschool, there's a lot of difference in the growth um, of the brain. And we know that a two-year-old uh, has approximately three-quarters the size and weight of an adult brain. And by the, by the time a child's five, as long as they're getting their nutritional needs met, that their brain will be 90% of the weight of an adult brain. Brain lateralization is what we look at when we think about the right brain and the left brain. And the corpus callosum is the nerves that connect the two portions of the brain, the left. The left brain and the right brain serve different functions. And for most people, the left side of the brain relates to and manages your logic, analyzing, sequencing. It puts things in a very linear, sequential manner. Uh, uses math, language, thinking about learning facts, um, th thinking in words words to songs and computation. The right brain relates to creativity, imagination, being holistic, intuition, your arts, the rhythm beats, your nonverbal, your feelings, visualization, and the tune of a song also relates to daydreaming. So again, I just added, uh, not to forget, sequential is the way the left brain t tends to work, and global is the way the right brain tends to work. Now, uh, in general, men tend to process language on the left side of their brain. So men tend to process language over here. Uh, so where do you think women tend to process language? Usually people say, oh, well, if she says the left brain for men, then usually it'd be the right brain for women, right? Eh, wrong. So men tend to process language over here on the left side. Women tend to process language equally on both sides. And it tends to be that little girls uh, begin to speak earlier than little boys, and maybe one of the reasons for that, they think, could be because they're using both sides of the brain instead of one to process language. Preschoolers view things a little bit differently than adults. They tend to see the small parts rather than looking at the big picture. Um, so this would be why it's more difficult for younger children, two, three, four, to think when you think about reading, where you have to take the letters, put them together into words, break them into sentences, because their eyes don't tend to focus on things quite that way. So here's an example. So is what do you see here when you look at this picture? I actually took a group of students over to the Horace Mann, a group of college students, and they did some, some tasks uh, with some kindergartners and some third graders. One of those was to show them this picture, and the first thing they said was, what do you see? The kindergartners, most of the kindergartners, not all, but most said, oh, I see a carrot, I see a tomato, I see a pear, I see carrots, cherries, and most of the third graders said, I see a bird. Now, some of both of those groups then saw the other part. So the, some of the third graders, first thing they saw was the bird, and then they saw the parts. And with the kindergartners, if they first saw the parts of fruit, some later on said, and it's a bird made out of fruits and vegetables. But preschoolers tend to first look at the smaller parts uh, and are less able to see the big picture at once. Another way to look at it is uh, that until around three or four years old, preschoolers tend to look more the inside of a two-dimensional object, ignoring the perimeter, and then later on, um, although the book says age four or five, I think it actually seems to be a little bit later, to look at the surrounding boundaries of an object. And then they say around six or seven, they look more systematically at the outside without focusing so much on the small details on the inside. Nightmares and night terrors 
Uh, some, for some preschoolers, sleeping is can be an issue. A nightmare is a vivid bad dream, and usually you remember it. And it happens at a certain time, tends to happen towards the morning hours. A night terror is when children tend to sort of seem like they're awake, but they're in an intense state of panic. Um, often they're not easy to comfort, and they don't usually remember what happened. So one of the differences, big differences, is with the nightmare, the children remember it in the morning. With the night terror, they don't remember. And they may even seem awake during the time that they're having it, uh, but they won't remember it in the morning. Health and wellness. The majority of preschoolers are pretty healthy. Uh, they get colds and things like that. And it's interesting because the majority of threats to these ch to children's health is from injuries due to accidents, so, and some of which can be prevented. And a lot of this is actually related to socioeconomics when we think of children who live in poorer, more urban areas compared to middle class kids. It could have to do with supervision. It could have to do with safety of what's around. Um, but it tends to be that those injuries are often more common in lower socioeconomic areas. Nutrition is another big issue when we talk about children. Uh, there's a lot of growing during preschool years, but not as much as there was during infancy. And one thing we find is that children's appetites decrease because they don't need as many calories as they did previously. So parents don't need to worry when children's appetites tend to decrease. Often, sometimes it's very abrupt where all of a sudden they just tend to eat less, and it's because they are not in the growth spurt that they were in previously. I know I personally am not a big proponent of the Clean Your Plate Club. Children have an automatic ability uh, to know when they're full and when parents push children to continue eating past that. I think they lose that kind of meter in their body that lets them know when they're full on their own and that can also contribute to obesity later on. Um, and children will eat when they're hungry. It's important to let children make that uh, decision themselves because children will eat if they are hungry. The average preschooler has about seven or eight minor colds and some other minor kind of respiratory illnesses over the course of the year in each year from three to five years old. Minor illnesses can have actually some unexpected benefits, builds up their immunities, helps children understand their own bodies better, allows children to learn how to cope with difficulties and being uncomfortable. It also can teach them how to empathize. Empathy is one of my favorite words. Helps children empathize when other people are sick and help them take care of them. And it teaches them to be more sympathetic and can teach them to be better caregivers. Unfortunately, socioeconomic factors can prevent some children from getting the health care they need. One thing we do know is that it tends to be often minority groups who have less dis may tend to have less, less uh, disposable income can often get not as good quality health care. This is a chart of children who had no doctor's visits within the last year and that would include those well visits when we go to the doctor just to make sure everything's okay because at those visits sometimes that's when they catch something early that might be wrong um, and if you just look at the differences between white, black, and Hispanic and it just shows the percentage of children that did not get a visit to the doctor in the last year. The book talks about cancer and AIDS, looking at cancer and leukemia and the survival rates. Also looks at AIDS. Uh, it's in the book on page 204. Please make sure to take the time to read that. We talk about emotional illness and depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, all different kinds of issues like that. Um, there is an increase in using drugs to treat those kind of disorders with children, um, as well as ADHD. Um, one of the issues, though, is that they're considered off-labeled when they use those kind of drugs with children because they're, the testing they've done on them and what they've been approved for is actually adults. So uh, they have to use extra precaution when using them with children because knowing what the consequences may be with children it gets a lot more complicated. Preschool children are at a greater risk from accidents than from any illness or any nutritional problems. Children have twice the likelihood of dying from an injury than from an illness before the age of 10. Uh, injuries result in part from children's high level of physical activity. So they're a lot more active uh, than <laughs> most of us as adults tend to be. Children are apt to take more risks than adults. Boys tend to be more active than girls, tend to take more risks and have a higher rate of injuries. There's a lot of ethnic differences as well, um, especially consider looking at how closely supervised the children are. Asian children tend to be more strictly supervised. They have the lowest rate of accidents for ch all children. Children who live in poverty are often exposed to more hazards and they're two times more likely to die from an injury than children living in affluence. The range of dangers include things like falls, 
burns, drowning, auto accidents, poisonous substances, and the sad thing is a lot of these could have been avoided. Please be sure to check out the section in the book on lead poisoning risks. It's a huge factor, especially when we talk about low SES, which is socioeconomic status, um, and the risks involved and the consequences of what um, lead poisoning can cause for children. So please be sure to read that in the book. Here's just a quick chart that looks at delinquency and aggression, which are just two of the things that lead poisoning can cause problems with. Child abuse and psychological maltreatment. The, in the United States, every single day, at least five children are killed by their parent or caregiver, and 140,000 are physically injured each year. So that means every single day, every single day, five children are killed from child abuse. Uh, it takes a lot of different physical forms, but it also can be more subtle, like psychological maltreatment, can be involving neglect of the parental responsibilities, emotional negligence, intimidation, humiliation, placing unrealistic demands and expectations on a child, or an exploitation of children. Three million children are abused or neglected annually in the United States. There have been research studies where they looked at the brains of women uh, who either had or had not been sexually abused and they found that there was a difference in the hippocampal volume in the brain and that that part of the brain was smaller in women who had been sexually abused compared to women who had not. So there's actually effects on the brain from abuse and there's been a lot of research in that area. In Austria, in Germany, in Israel, in Sweden, and in China, they outlaw any form of physical punishment directed towards a child. The hypothesis, the cycle of violence hypothesis, looks at, uh, argues that abuse and neglect with children who have been abused and neglected have a predisposition to be abusive as adults. Research does show, however, that the majority of children who were abused do not grow up to be abusers themselves. Children coming from poverty or single parenthood or where there's a lot more marital conflict tend to be at a higher risk. These are some signs, warning signs, with child abuse. Um, this is a chart that's from your book, and it just looks at things that are obvious and visible, bite or choke marks, burns, where they seem maybe seeming like they're in pain without an apparent reason. Maybe they're fearful of adults in their lives or the caregivers in their lives. Maybe they're wearing clothing that covers their, up their body in warm weather. You know, it would be clothing that would be more appropriate for colder weather. Could be extreme behavior like being very aggressive or very passive or withdrawn. Could be very fearful of physical contact. Uh, if you're going into a field that you're going to be working with children, you are what's called a mandated reporter, and by law, you need to report it. If you're working in a school system, you're supposed to find out what the school's protocol is uh, and who you're supposed to report it to. This is the definition we just talked about, the cycle of violence. Um, most abusive parents do later regret, regret uh, and show that they do feel badly for what they've done, but that doesn't uh, excuse it. So how do we keep preschoolers healthy? It's important to have well-balanced diet, proper sleep, keep them away from people who are sick. Uh, the whole immunizations debate, uh, there's a lot of different opinions on that one. This just shows the immunization schedule of what is recommended for immunizations. Gross motor and fine motor skills, because of that myelination going on in the brain, there's a lot of development going on where by three years old, children have, are, can they're, they're jumping and hopping and skipping and running, uh, and by four and five, they've got greater control. So more of that, you know, when they're running, being able to come to a quick stop. This just shows some major uh, gross motor milestones for three-year-olds four-year-olds and five-year-olds. So where a three-year-old, they start running, they can't stop quickly, but by five, they can stop and turn and things like that. At the same time, fine motor development is happening with those delicate body movements. And here are some examples of fine motor development, going from cutting paper to being able to fold it into triangles, to being able to fold it in halves and quarters, different drawings, puzzles, things like that. Be sure to read in the book the section on potty training. Children's drawing comes in different stages, um, and, oh, you also missed on handedness, sorry, on handedness. By age five, you can tell whether they're going to be left-handed or right-handed. So be sure to read the part in the book on handedness. Also, these stages of drawing, where they start with the scribbling, then shapes, then the pictorial. Be sure to read that section as well. Hopefully this was helpful to you, and um, don't forget about the roles of art as children learn and develop and looking back questions 
Hopefully that was helpful.